Hi everybody, this is Damien from Legend Life. Uh, with our Fit Life After 40 talk talks, we look to speak to inspirational people who are out there living their best life after 40. And today we have the pleasure of speaking with Ted McDonald, also known as Barefoot Ted. Uh, Ted is an ultra runner. He's also a he's also a barefoot runner and also an entrepreneur. He's the founder of Lunar Sandals, an outdoor sandals company. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about Ted's uh, story, how he became a barefoot runner, and then also his perspective on wellness and fitness after 40. So how are you going today, Ted? Howdy. Well, you know, I'm, I, I couldn't be happier sitting here in Santa Barbara where I vote with my body, the primal vote, you know. Santa Barbara, California, please come and visit, folks. It's a wonderful place in, in, in California. <laughs> no, definitely. So to get started, maybe you can give us a little bit of a background, your journey to becoming a runner first off, um, and then the shift uh, to actually becoming a barefoot runner. So maybe you can give us the beginning, how it all started. Right on. Well, you know, my own um, background growing up in Southern California in the 1970s, back in that time, early skateboarding days, even before urethane wheels, everybody was barefoot. Barefoot was a very common uh style because it turned out it was the best you could get wet you could be dry it was good for skateboarding it was good for surfing and so forth and so on so much so in the 1970s my favorite brand of clothing was called hang 10 and it was it had two golden feet embroidered on the chest you know where you normally would have whatever it had two golden feet so you've got to put in perspective a character known as barefoot ted coming from Southern California surf culture of the 1970s, we didn't need anybody to tell us that the barefoot was a rather sophisticated and capable piece of equipment. You could just see what we did with them all the time. Now, something happened though in the, in the about 75, everybody started having urethane wheels and we started going so much faster. And um, there was a local shoe company known as Van Doren which is now known as Vans. And we started wearing those tennis shoes. And, you know, that was my, you know, the beginning of the shoe uh, experience for me. We all started needing shoes. So I kind of have seen when a culture gets a new artifact and suddenly everybody's using it. Well, then um, I actually, uh, before I really became uh, a barefoot runner, I tried to become a regular runner a few different times throughout my uh, uh, early 20s, all the way through into my early 30s. I'd always thought that running would be a good idea. I had seen a famous uh, senator's son of California run a marathon when he was 40 years old, and I was at his birthday party, and I was like, wow, I was like 20 at the time, and I thought, oh my goodness, 40-year-olds can run a marathon? So I put in my head, maybe that's something healthy to do. I'll have to give it a try. Now I'm 57 now, but in my later 30s, I started really thinking I've got to solve this problem of running for myself. So now my trajectory, I thought, I figured that um, there must be some modern technology now that has improved on the running shoe and the, the boom of the running shoe that I sort of was seeing happening, but not really part of it. Even when I was in high school, uh, when I would do track, many of us still ran barefoot. So it yeah. was like, it was like I had this foggy memory, but of course, technology had certainly done something good, I would assume. And so I started, uh, you know, um, experimenting with some modern footwear in, in my late 30s. And the crazy thing was, is I, I would have to stop running after about an hour. It wasn't like I didn't have enough energy. I had plenty of energy, but I couldn't tolerate the pain anymore. It was like, yeah. it was like uh, just wearing me down. You know, my feet were hurting, my back was hurting. And I just was wondering, how do those guys do that? You know, are they taking painkillers? Are they, <laughs> do they have some kind of stuff? Anyway, I finally found a pair of something called Kango Jumps. It was a Swiss company that had made like this basically a boot with a leaf spring in it. And I thought, this might be the technology I'm looking for. 
unfortunately, the boots ended up, instead of allowing me to have more time on my feet, I actually got the same sort of exhausted from pain feeling after a shorter amount of time. Couldn't quite figure it out. Finally, I decided kind of almost in frustration to do some research on is anybody maybe maybe barefoot I'd kind of heard things in the past I had remembered my own experience I had an aunt that had some track records from high school I sort of through the grapevine had heard of like the Tarumara and other runners who had run barefoot but I hadn't seen any real evidence so yeah. I went ahead and googled it this is in like you know the 1997 let's say night or uh well, anyway, early 2000s. Yeah. And I suddenly start seeing there's some interesting stuff going on. There are some people making some interesting claims. So I started investigating this and I spent quite a few days reading everything I could on the internet at that time. And it suddenly came to the first time I was going to test out this theory. And it the idea was that I had not really ever had I had never heard before at that time was that there was a running technique that was described at the time as ball heel ball landing more on the ball of the foot letting the heel touch down and then coming back off the ball of the foot that was enough to get my my mental machinery working about yeah. oh that kind of hmm and then just sort of the idea of the position you might be in when you're landing and how you could through a quicker turnover and cadence trap and in indeed sort of like tune into the same kind of feeling you might feel as when you're jumping rope and you get the rhythm just right where you're getting a tiny little return on investment because you're loading the structure in such a way that you can kind of find that perfect balance between the quickness of your jumps and how much more efficient it can get. Yeah. When I started realizing that there was a way of playing with that space within running itself, and then I also found out that the equipment that was perhaps best suited for that experiment mm -hmm. was the bare foot itself. And on top of it all, you have this person that is not going from zero to a hundred in barefooting. I've grown up in a barefoot culture. I know about, you know, it's not like, I'm a kid who's been wearing like orthotic boots his whole life. And then yeah. they tear those off and say, Junior, you've been healed, go. You know, it's like, no, no, not at all. And however, it was instantaneously obvious for me at that time that in order for me to reach these goals that had become important for me at that time, run a marathon and so forth and so on, that this was going to be the road to it. It became, it was instantaneously obvious that I had been missing something fundamental in the form that I was using in order to move. And once I knew that at one and the same time, I also realized when um, getting down to our own experiences become the thing from which we find something that can leverage ourselves up and also many others too. And I started realizing I wasn't the only one in this situation trying to solve the problem of how to move well comfortably so that I can get fitter and achieve some of these goals that I had in mind, I realized that I was, yeah, it was going to be kind of a pioneer. Yeah. It, but really not because it was new. It was just new for us, new for that moment and a new insight that was getting some clear. And that's the other thing. At the same time, I was beginning to do my experimentation there was a lot of, let's say, backup material in, in research and in writings that all eventually led to the book called Born to Run that came out in 2009 that more or less sealed the deal on this aspect of looking at running our evolutionary biological position in it, how humans are designed to be able to like maybe become more efficient through a certain pattern of running, how bare, the barefoot should indeed be functional and if you want to be overall fit the one thing that i ultimately hesitated on and all and and to this day um, no longer i'm not interested if barefooting in and of itself makes somebody perform better in a performance metric metric that's about 
time, distance, and speed. It may, it may not, I don't know. There obviously have been situations where pure barefoot runners have won entire fields of runners in Olympic games and others throughout history. But whether it's the best thing or the right thing, well, that's a whole nother debate about how important is performance for overall health and the health span of an individual, as much as efficiency of movement and um, uh, continual practice of movement, rather than just finding some performance, boom, wear the machine out and then you know yeah. lick the wounds until you die. How about, how can we find a way to um, operate this default equipment in our body such that it's more or less finding homeostasis, finding a way to gain vitality and um, uh, health by moving well, but not because it's being driven by the, the, the common vectors of time, distance and all that, but rather how well, and it turns out where my investigations go has to do with how you're breathing too. Yeah. Learning how to, um, learning how to contain oneself and turn running into a hygienic practice rather than, or on top of, and in conjunction with a performance-based sport, I think the practice, and this is where I, as I, maybe as I approach 60, three more years, I've been thinking I've got to have, what is it as an elder I want to share? Well, the prequel is practice, lifestyle practices that are fun and good for you easy and are micro dosing like the least amount that gives you the greatest impact and barefoot running in the way that i do it and the breathing i do and now, you know many years later after i've gone through all the you know I've do, i still am training for a hundred mile race that i'll do this year in leadville colorado so it's a it it's a great way for me to evaluate whether or not my uh style Yep. has application to a real world problem. You've got to run a hundred miles. You're above 10,000 feet. You're climbing up to, you know, you're having serious issues. Can you pull it? If you, if you can mentally and physically pull it all together and do a, an event like that in such a way that you feel you, you can do it feeling good about it the whole way. Yeah. That becomes, and then it, it inspires other people because they think a hundred miles, you know, whatever, how's that? Pop? And then I say, well, this is what I do. And that's sort of, that's sort of my shtick right now. I'm trying to show with certain principles, it's not necessarily doing a lot of training that you're going to get the bang for your buck that I'm looking for. I'm looking for vitality, health, happiness, the feeling of well-being, just the, you know, and giving myself more freedom to be almost like the kite with the string cut. You know, I, <laughs> I don't have like regimented, you know, I have this 57 years of riffing on being outdoors and playing outdoors and moving outdoors. And for me these days, running is a fundamental because it's the one you can do almost anywhere at any time. Yeah. But it carries over into skateboarding and to uh, other sports that I like to do. It's just such a fundamental. It's such a fundamental skill that to not gain the practice of, you know, some practice of barefoot running just as part of your weekly, daily, whatever. It seems to me that's a, that would be a terrible thing to, to miss out on because it's so simple, right? You yeah. don't even need any equipment. <laughs> so and maybe, a mile or two is more than enough, actually. That's the, the other thing that I wanted to say. So let's uh, walk through because a lot of people will be going, well, how can he run a hundred miles and like bare feet? So let's talk. Oh, right. So let's talk about some of the things you have managed to accomplish in bare feet, just to give people perspective that it is possible because a lot right. of people will be thinking traditional for, you know, what about the impact? What about the risk to my feet? All of those kind right, of things right, will be right. running through their mind. So I guess maybe you could kind of like back up and then, you know, talk a little bit more about how you can actually run barefoot, you know, and in the, you know, off terrain or even on the hardened surfaces, you know, right, talk a right, little right. bit more about the cadence you're kind of talking about. Oh, right, 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 right. Well, yeah. So 
once you once you start looking at this as a practice rather than as something that you're you know, needing to perform at perform with that's at least the state that take i'm you know this is the way i'm looking at it then um uh, and well and going back to like what i've done are in the past by the way i wouldn't do leadville barefooted not at all um, yeah. leadville i'll be wearing sandals that's not possible to do barefooted in the uh time allowance you know and so I'm not trying to see how far I can go to destroy my feet or something yeah. like that. It's really more about learning how to be so aware of what your capacities are and strengthening them in a real sort of like, if you learn how to just do some light training of your, whatever your normal running would be and get ready to tone it down and go a completely different direction. And that's something that your body's capable of doing then I would assume each person's gonna, that's a self experiment of one. And in other words, it's very, very hard for me to place. Like there were people like, take your shoes off and you'll solve every problem. Look, I have no idea yeah. how that will pan out for everyone and anyone. But speaking for myself and therefore, you know, a, a human being for the most part, as far as I can tell, I was, it was, it was only through experimenting that way that I was able to come up with and tune into the cadence and the style that I described. Now, many people now on the internet these days, there's you know endless ways people are trying to encourage people to do this for them for the good of themselves. And one aspect of it, of course, is a huge growth in the whole area of footwear, where where shoes are at the very least not by design automatically making it so the foot would actually work more poorly rather than better yeah i.e narrow pointed toe boxes giant uh arch supports uh, overly cushioned overly cramped whatever um we've seen a sea change over the last decade in footwear for running and runners and for hikers and hikers and trail running and all the rest where the opportunity for more people to be able to have functional feet inside even shoes is higher than ever now. So learning how to do some pure barefoot movement, running, whatever, on any kind of terrain is the beginning, I would say, for some people, if this is their cup of tea, of really getting a nuanced understanding of how they work, how their feet work, how, what it feels like to move well, because Eat, when I've run marathons pure barefoot yeah. on on tarmac and qualified to run the Boston Marathon running barefoot. So when you learn how to run light, the issue is not about impact because you're back to using your body as the spring. You're not just like when you get your, back to that idea of if you could jump rope really well, such that you got yourself tuned to basically waste none of the energy of landing and getting putting the least amount back in to keep you in that you know that cadence that yeah. that number of about when you start dialing that in it's a whole it's it's not just the will the whole body's got to be involved and I, you know i used to think oh you know i would show people how to jump rope you know doing a pretend jump rope and i'll say jumping's like this and then i realized not everybody can do that just automatically Many people can't just start bouncing on their feet. I did you know that? I didn't know that. I was like, <laughs> oh hell, okay, maybe I better talk about this a little bit more. But regardless, I can say this: by going to the style of doing mostly barefoot training or sandal training, I'm 57. I can still feel comfortably, enjoyably go and on long distance trail runs. I can, you know, shoot to do the hundred mile trip and in a way that I'm not breaking myself down. I'm not like having cortisone shots and yada, yada, blah, blah, blahs, or, you know, knee replacements, or I'm keeping it all within the scope of, a, uh, you know, taking care of myself, not yeah. trying to see if I can break myself. And ultimately, as I've gotten older, encouraging people to that becomes, in other words, instead of performance, performance, performance. Um, it starts becoming well-being. How do I nourish myself? How do I make myself more resilient, regenerative? How do I 
gain some insight about becoming more efficient so that I can um, continue to find the joy in just being able to move out there in a fit, vital body. That's, that, that's all that it's about for me now. That's the, everything I'm doing is tuned into that. And barefoot's just want, barefoot running just is one of those um, natural, simple ones to find and to, to, to suggest that goes back, um, it's not a new concept, by the way. There have been people writing about a little bit of running, barefoot running every day as a hygienic health tonic. I, I know runner, I know writers from the 1800s writing stuff like that. Yeah. So what for you are the key benefits to well-being running bare feet? Well, one of the most important and interesting things about barefoot foot running, and particularly in combination with the way I, uh, the breathing style that I, I, I do a lot of my running nose breathing. It's a natural yep. way to just keep your heart rate lower and also to contain your enthusiasm and learn how to stretch out uh, the, how smoothly you can go on breathing relatively. I mean, these are on quote unquote, you know, a routine run or a practice, you know, as a practice rather than training. And I concentrate on the feeling of learning how to feel extremely uh, light and um, uh, connected to my body. You you're, you're just tend to be, when you're barefoot, you're feeling so much more, it's requiring you to be that much more there in order to A, navigate the surroundings. Obviously, if you're barefoot, you're more vulnerable. But you have to remember that vulnerability is part of your species hallmark. Our vulnerability requires us to be more aware of what we're doing while we're doing it. We are a vulnerable creature, but that's our birthright. That's a, it's allowed us to become uh, so much more precise in what we do. Uh, in, in other words, I, I will make that argument and more aware of what we're doing while we're doing it. If you were a robot and you didn't feel anything in your feet or lower legs, you could do all kinds of things that, you know, I mean, you know, that would be different. You wouldn't be a <laughs> yeah. human anymore. And in some ways, we got so carried away with finding equipment and things that would help us not have to deal with our vulnerability that ultimately it allowed us to go beyond what our body would have told us was too far too soon. So I say by getting back to the fundamentals and appreciating your own body, particularly those of us who are older you suddenly have a new piece of equipment that you're never going to get tired. <laughs> You've got it there. You know, you can't throw it away. It's going to be with you from now until the end of time. Why don't you play around and seeing what it can do? And other people like me can be, maybe um, you can gain some inspiration or some insight of why that might be worthwhile to try. You might also come to the realization that maybe that's not for you because of whatever your story leads up to you hearing this message. But I will say this, it's clear to me that the more you can find ways to move about and do many of the things that you do in order to keep yourself fit and healthy, more in bare feet or in functionally strong feet, you're not gonna be at a disadvantage if you learn how to do that more. You're gonna yeah. be definitely benefiting yourself in balance and in so many other aspects. Now, I'm not an expert beyond myself though. I don't, I don't really know what to tell other people, but I do know about sandals and that's why, you know, in other words, coming to the idea of becoming a surfer, like a surfer making surfboards, sandals become a way of sort of creating a platform that people use to do their outdoor activities without me knowing, I can't know exactly how you're going to use it. But I do know that it's an old school tool that we obsess on making well so that we can do the things that we want to do. And then lo and behold, people use them. And suddenly from all over the world, we get stories and reports and photos and so forth and so on of people who have taken something that inspired me back in the day. I pulled it together, found a way to create an object that people could use as a tool to do this style of running. And now I have a company and I'm talking to you about it. So. There are interesting things that you can leverage out of the experience and the equity of living long enough to be able to tell stories this long. Okay. So tell us a little bit about 
um, sandals and there's the five finger shoes and then how they help you kind of like replicate running or provide the protection you need and you know obviously as you said like long view or other kind of like um, races equivalent you may not be able to run that you know barefoot oh um, right so so how do how do these shoes uh help you and what are the benefits of using these shoes and then maybe we can talk about how lunar shoe lunar sandals all came about got it okay well when you really get down and think about it like i do and i do you could look at the simple sandal as perhaps one of the oldest continuously made human inventions because it literally persistent hunting from the view of some people trying to piece together the story of human genesis. Uh, some stories go along the lines that we were what are called persistence hunters. And there are people who can do this even to this day. And this hunting style doesn't even require a weapon other than your own capacity to basically spook an animal usually larger than you, heavy, uh, in the middle of the day, get it running, you follow its footprints, you get it running again, you trick it to run back the direction you were running, you trick it again, and 18 to 32 miles later, those are the ones that we have a recording of in the San people of South Africa, you have an 800 pound kudu animal following to its death, you haven't even done anything yet, <laughs> and it's near the village, and that'll feed a village of 30, from various ways for 30 days. So, you know, it's a pretty good skill. <laughs> yeah. So um, the default equipment is already great. And then think about it. What would be the first thing you do if you've ever been barefoot? And I have in situations where it's better you weren't barefoot. It'd be great if you had a shoe. You quickly find out, and any human creator would do the same, that if you were to step in, let's say some animal dung, and then you stepped in some dry grass, and then you suddenly realize, oh, that feels, I mean, everything's the same, but it's not quite so tender. And you start realizing you get a superpower if you could suddenly move across certain areas that maybe have sharp rocks or brambles or other things that make other animals not be able to do that. It doesn't take long for a human being to figure out that a little bit of a foot covering from all, all kinds of different carcasses and weavings and all the rest ends up becoming a fundamental probably earliest human invention yeah so that being said continuing to be able to riff on a design you know i like to think of the natural selection of footwear in human society i started riffing on that okay if humans are better off barefoot and that's great so then what were the earliest communities doing they obviously weren't designing shoes to um because they thought the foot was broken by default yeah. they probably were coming up with things that paid homage to the foot basically uh didn't try to redesign the foot but rather provided it with some extra mm, resiliency particularly on the bottom and so luna sandals and other footwear basically when it's good it's basically just creating some portable ground some way to allow your foot to do all the things that it likes to do having evolved on this earth, bend and flex and splay and so forth, but also have, why not bring just a little piece of ground, just the right texture and comfort level to allow you to sort of like uh, replicate the ideal landing conditions. I think that's our earliest human invention. I think you see it on human feet all throughout time, all throughout cultures, from warriors to royalty. And I'm just keeping that little flame alive with materials and processes that didn't exist for any other sandal makers up until today. So it becomes like a tool that people use both as voting with their money to support a company like Luna, but also buying into the storyline of this is a tool. Why don't you go out and use it, man? This is a good tool. Yeah. Go out and ride the waves. Go out there and get some sunshine on you. Go out there and let your foot be exposed. Don't be afraid kind of attitude. That's what Luna really is about. Okay. So how did the actual uh, beginning kind of like start? Like, so where did you, you said you did this evolution of learning about shoes throughout history, but what was the kind of like aha moment, I'm going to build a shoe. 
is it something you just built for yourself or you had a mind it was going to be a business or how did it all kind of well i started riffing on designs all over the world the most interesting ones were the waraji sandals of japan it's a it's an old it's a funny it's funny that the name is waraji and um in mexico there's something called warachi and akarachi yeah and actually there's some evidence that there probably was some kind of connection it's a rather interesting uh, anthropological journey um that has yet to be resolved but it turns out that uh there is some kind of connection there but regardless the most important aha moment came and it's uh, in the book born to run which i'm assuming you might have read or you will read someday and in that book you'll see that I was down there getting ready to run a race with an entire community of people who have maintained the ancient sandal making traditions that have existed all over the world. And they're still alive and well, and they lived on the border of the state I was living in. So <laughs> you can be sure when, when I saw that, and it was palpably clear that this was possible, and I started, let's say, being like a surfer for the first time, seeing a surfboard and a surfer on a surfboard. And then I tried one of those surfboards. Well, the rest is history. And that's happened innumerable times. That is the story of human sharing. Yeah. Basically, every kind of invention that's ever been invented, somebody figured out, and then somebody else tried to do it a little better, and then somebody else tried to do it a little better, then somebody got really good at doing it. And then somebody else got really good at doing something else. And then somebody came up with a way to trade things between the two. And well, anyway, you know where I'm going with that. Yeah. So, and then what's the vision with Luna? So what are you hoping to achieve? Well, to reduplicate an experience and to um, encourage people to vote with their lifestyle how it is that they're going to make the best version of themselves. And I'm making the argument that learning how to use sandals and learning how to connect to this very primal part of every human experience since the beginning of time, as far as we know, it's a good idea to play with the default equipment. It's a good idea to re-examine the simplest solutions that work the best. I love riffing on that concept in all aspects of my life sandals are just one of them okay so now let's go back to your personal fitness and wellness like as you kind of like indicated you are now less focused on performance or it's never actually been a focus for you you for you it's all been about enjoying um getting fit and being able to you know basically enjoy being outside so what's your overriding philosophy with uh, fitness and wellness well i think fitness should be focused on something uh, not not that not, when i say performance i guess ultimately it would be great to have indicators that are allowing us to have some kind of points some kind of way of determining whether or not we're making progress in something we're doing. So the idea of being able to have a measurable way to determine our progress in any sport or conditioning of some kind is, I'm not saying isn't valuable. Yeah, It's extremely valuable. And um, uh, finding ways that will, because it can often motivate people to do more than they would if they didn't have something to shoot for. So I'm not trying to, uh, take that away from anybody or um, take away their performance goals of some kind or another. What I'm discovering, though, is that there are aspects of performance that are not well measured or understood, but can be felt and be, can be experienced. And so well-being is a very difficult one to put a specific number on. I think we will, over time, come up with better biometric readings on things that are really important and valuable information about health that are probably not in line with the way people look at health right now today. Uh, obviously, we're going to be always making new breakthroughs and insights, 
I mean, one huge topic would be just the microbiome that we're made up of that's many times more cells of something other than us living in us than there is us living in us. Yeah. I mean, that's a fascinating topic in and of itself. So well-being to me means self-reported well-being, being able to overlook my entire life, how I sleep, how I eat, how I think and feel, what I'm capable of doing, what I'm capable of imagining. These things are not compressing or becoming less as I gain, get older, but rather become more expansive and the opportunities and, and the ability to stay calm also in the face of all the, the new opportunities and chances you know, to do various things. So well-being to me is an attitude that is, has a corresponding, let's say results list that's about well-being and what you can still do in your body, uh, you know, I, I can go and like whatever. So some of the things I can do now, I know I couldn't even do a year ago. You know, yeah. I mean, and I could, and I never could do before that. So like gaining new skills in 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 um, uh, in like for example, two, three weeks ago I went to Yalapa, Mexico, for a one week breath holding conference, like learning free diving techniques but other things too that I had, and it's like, oh my gosh, an entirely whole new um, uh, treasure, treasure chest of fascinating new possibilities. And then, you know, I've, the new, the whole nutraceutical world and, and, and the whole, there's all these new, so <clears throat> ultimately well-being is being in a state of uh, living whereby it's palpable to you by what you're doing, how your life's going, what you're able to achieve, not just in some kind of one metric of how well you were able to perform on an oxygen uh, usage yeah. test. But ultimately, I want to be in that sweet spot, that flow state in everything I do, I, I, on every, every project I'm working on, on every interview I'm doing, on every, as much as possible, get into that state where I am feel like I'm breathing, I'm relaxed, I'm holding my body in a good position. I'm feeling like, yeah, I, I, like I'm vital and I'm able to make uh, important, um, I'm able to gain new insights still in life by just interacting and sharing a story and hearing, so that's, I mean, it's a very, um, I mean, in some way, it's mundane. I mean, it, 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 people know when they feel better. Yeah. I'm just saying, I'm knowing it. And these are the things I'm doing. Basically, very, very basic things. Time in sunlight, time outdoors, time barefoot, time in natural surroundings, moving and playing a lot and eating well and experimenting with nutraceuticals and other things and see what, what sticks and... and um, ultimately take full responsibility for my own health and realize that I'm the, I have to be the expert on me. No one else can do that job. Well, people can help a lot, but ultimately I'm the one who has to move, you know, you listener have to do the uh, directing and the decision yeah. making for you. But some of us, when, when you hear people like me and others self-report that because they've done X, Y, and Z, they're feeling better. That's just a clue that you've got to find what that's going to be for you to get into the same spot. But it is possible. And um, I think more and more people are doing it now than ever before. So don't listen to the old, the old story. I'm getting older. I'm getting tighter. I'm getting yada. I'm getting, well, then change something, change it up, find a new way. Think, it, think outside the box. Don't accept anything on face value. Um, would be what Barefoot Ted says. <laughs> no, very good. So it sounds like you have a pretty good awareness about how you feel in different situations. And then you use that as a, a yardstick that you measure yourself against everything you kind of like do in your life. And then, as you said, you never kind of like fixate on one thing. You keep on adapting and trying new things. You, you're continuously looking to evolve. And so you're testing things. You already know what your yardsticks are. You know, you have a sense of how you feel. And you'll test something new and see, does that resonate? No. Okay, I'll try that. Does that resonate? Okay, maybe I'll put an ad on it. So you, you are very much in ownership of how your body kind of like 
feels and reacts and you're always trying to get better which is kind of like an interesting perspective yeah and i think that comes and so that's just being true to my roots uh authentic to my roots in surf and skate culture which really didn't have any at the time that i was part of it it didn't really have a um it hadn't really become a sport yet there was you know there was some competitions and this and that but it was really much more about shared experience and um style yeah and um it it turns out there that element there is that element in the um running community to some degree particularly like the some of the events i go down to in the copper canyons in mexico there's a whole you know the the traditional runners have their all their whole kit you know they have their own thing and their colors and their ways and i really love that um you know that element of style and of um uh you know a little bit of bravado the you know they're, they're they they like just showing their vitality you know yeah and um um I, I i like doing the same i mean i think a lot of the balance sports are like that like surfing and skateboarding i do some other stuff that i i do stuff that requires balance every day like yeah. like the equivalent of surfing and i have to say that the sports where you are in that gliding state that requires full, you have to be there now. You can't be, and moving in bare feet, by the way, I have some light runs that I can do. They're, they're not far, but they're extremely complex terrains yeah. that require me to be complete, like every, every footfall is almost like a chess move. And I find that to be really, I mean, not dangerous. It's not like if I miss the mark, yeah. you know, there's going to be an emergency. It's not like riding a Ducati uh, between cars, right? That's the other beautiful thing. You can sort of push the edge of uh, caution just a bit, but the ramifications are not like outrageous, but it does. There is something to be back to that vulnerability concept, and I think people should take it into consideration. Maybe they'd never even thought of it, but there is something about being able to adapt to being a little bit more vulnerable than you're used to, so so that you become aware what it's what that feeling's like. I mean, it's almost like there is something valuable to that. I don't. I. I. And I'm trying to think how in the future I'll apply that to some kind of coaching or. I don't have any like at this time at this moment in my life i've got all these like things that i want to share again and i did coaching in the past but then i just realized it's just it's such a lot of work and it's been so much work just trying to get my company going and succeeding at it and i just started real i'm waiting when i've got this baby doing good enough <laughs> job that i can go back to my real love which is finding a way to package the best insights i'm gaining and find a way to create experiences where people can come and give that a try. I, I really love uh, as a participant being in an environment like that, but I'm starting to realize there's certain things that I need to be sharing more um, because they're working for me. Yeah. They're working for me. And I, it's, it's because I've been, you know, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of false, you know, box canyons and other, but I keep going because I mean, that's what we do. That's what yeah. we do. And we, we're definitely all benefiting from learning these stories from others of to stay on the path, to stay focused, to find the solution, to not give up because there's a breakthrough there, always waiting, some hankering need, some untapped vision is the thing that often breaks the camel's back. And you might be the one who, you know, solving a problem for yourself help thousands of other people solve it for themselves too. I, I no reason not to believe that's possible. And the older we get the, the chances back to that one percentage point a year, man, I'm, I'm gonna be at 57% starting here on <laughs> July 1st. I'm getting ready to come up with some new ideas and I'm gonna keep on it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you're, uh, when you talk about vulnerability, it's a little bit about getting yourself out of your comfort zone. So, and then, because you're you're taking yourself into a risk kind of situation and it creates a heightened awareness which it seems to be where you're very focused on and then you become more aware of things and then the one thing i think people forget is that if you don't grow 
you kind of regress. So everyone thinks once you like say, let's take a training perspective, everyone goes, you get to a particular level and then you're just going to stay there. You just keep doing the same thing and you'll stay there. But it, your body doesn't like that. It just goes, no, no, this, this is too comfortable. Okay, we don't need to utilize these resources anymore. So we'll start switching off um, because it's all too easy for us. So then we start going backwards. So I think where you're, where you're going all the time is, always getting yourself a little bit uncomfortable your body never gets a chance to kind of like really get settled and then it's always forced to adapt so it's always changing so that's keeping you growing all the time i think that's it i think and so that that's why i've i've been resistant to structures mostly so that i could do this self-experimentation and since i have a gift of being able to share my experience, you know, I have an audience and I have, yeah. you know, obviously I'm glib. So I think that um, that becomes an important resource for other people, not that I have the solution for them per se, but rather there's a style in this that gives them a little bit of um, empowerment to like find what it's going to work for them, realizing that each of, of us in a way is solving the riddle of our own lives anyway. I mean, yeah. no one else has the complexity of what we are and has housed it for as long as we have. But there might be an aha moment that a person like a barefoot Ted gives, hey, I never did think of that. I never did try that. And then lo and behold, that might be one of the, you know, the things that sort of gets it rolling in the, a better direction. So certainly some people will listen to this and um, maybe uh, uh, get inspired to uh, tap into this way a little bit and see if it doesn't, uh, provide them with some um, something that will, uh, you know, reinvigorate their um, willingness to be an experimental animal for themselves. <laughs> yeah. And then we are experimental animals, aren't we? we it's, all trial, it's all trial and error. So, totally. so what does a week look like for you? So what's the training regime you kind of like follow? Well, you know, so that's, there, there are, um, underlying certainties almost yeah one is i have an espresso maker and i do have coffee in the morning <laughs> and so i i i uh i have that kind of uh, a uh you know habitual sort of like uh plant medicine uh um ritual every morning um so uh, don't be alarmed folks that's true um and um I often go by what the weather's going to be like. Santa Barbara, if it's sunny in the morning, like in the winter, it's often sunny in the morning. The first thing I'll be doing then in the winter is be getting out there with the, you know, basically trunks on, maybe a hat, and uh, do a, a light, uh, you know, maybe 10 minute jog, run, walk, followed by some breathing and maybe, oh, I've been, I got into really this year a lot of doing, um, headstands like doing them really well yeah and like getting really good form on that and i got been getting way better at that and i'm realizing a, a great increase in core strength because of it so um if it's a cloudy day like today um it started out cloudy they call it the june gloom here in santa barbara i have a sauna and a cold plunge and i fired up that sauna <laughs> And I got in there, uh, my wife and I did a hot and a cold together. I got, and I just love that. I love the extremes of hot and cold. That's been something passive exercise. And uh, I'll, I, get, I do a lot of skateboarding. Um, yeah. I, was, uh, I, I had the world record for a while distance on a skateboard in 24 hours, <laughs> okay. 242 miles. But it was a technique called long distance pumping. So I have a skateboard that I'm telling you, it's one of the best um, core wet workouts ever. And uh, I just love, I, I basically can surf. Like, it's like I'm surfing practically. I can make this board just by wiggling it really go. So I'll, always some kind of exhilarate. Uh, so I have all kinds of different wheels. I have an antique high wheel bicycle. <laughs> I have... So I've always something, if there's a wheel on it and I can make it flow, I'll be, I'll be giving it a try. I'll, I might just pop in the ocean for a swim here or there. I mean, while I'm on a run. <laughs> so kind of it just, oh, oh, one of, oh, one of my favorites I do have to mention is my wife and I, 
almost every day play a game called smash ball. It's a very simple wooden racket, rubber ball, and we okay. call it our marriage therapy. <laughs> and we're so good at it. People stop and like, you know, get mesmerized by our ongoing. And the goal is to just keep it going. I'm telling you, couples out there, learn how to play smash ball. I guarantee <laughs> you will benefit from it greatly that we almost make a joke my wife and i like we need to be like this is the mayor you know people say oh when she win and we'll, we're like no nobody we both win therapy it's therapy <laughs> trust me 10 bucks from amazon so it's kind of like that very um very very random ultimately um and i do a lot of my own cooking too and um here in Santa Barbara, we have a lot of great food, food including grass-fed animals, including seafood, including, you know, the endless variety of fruits and vegetables, as you know. So I uh, take a lot of pleasure in, in um, uh, playing a role in um, preparing that. So it's like, it's a lifestyle. And I like to say this concept of like, you have a philosophy of life, you have an attitude about from that philosophy, you do actions based on that philosophy and that attitude. Those actions ultimately lead to some kind of results. And the all outcome of it all is to try to develop that lifestyle that you're looking for that keeps this whole thing going. So this past week or two, as you, from some of our encounters on the, uh, uh, has been, I've been playing a role in my company as custom, as one of the primary answerers of customer service phone calls uh, for the last two or three weeks, along with emails and texts. And it has been one heck of a tough job <laughs> um, keeping me on my toes and having to, you know, uh, be at a computer a lot this week, but interspersed with taking breaks, you know, that's the other thing. I do a lot of the work we all have to do in the modern world, but I make sure and that's voting with your body, making sure you're in a place where you can get outdoors. Um, so even though I spend more where I live because of where it is, I really do feel very much um, because of the tools we have, the 21st century, all, that I can be outdoors and I can still feel the call or answer a text or and still get a little bit of that. Sound. So that's a very another that quote unquote life work balance, whatever really, really find a way more and more where you're able to be productive. And at the same time, you're not destroying your health in order to be productive. That I guess is a great lesson of 57 yeah. years of living. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. So, so how does that all fit into the primal lifestyle? Well, the primal lifestyle concept really for me is really making sure it gets down to bedrock philosophy in a way. It's sort of like, let's, you know, play around with as much as you can gather that corresponds and resonates with your own experience about um, uh, your hypotheses that you might come up with what, what it's like, what's, what are some fundamental things for human beings? Or what's even more importantly, what's fundamental for me as a human being? Yep. And, um, it turns out many of the things that are just commonly understood for people who grow up in beach cultures, barefoot, outdoors in the sun, at the beach, out, you know, playing in nature, uh, being mesmerized by sunrises and sunsets, the moon coming out, birds and all the rest. Yeah. Um, that, uh, that those kind of experiences are immediately available to almost anyone anywhere, regardless of how you know, I mean, Santa Barbara is a cherry picked spot for this kind of observations, but everywhere has them in their own way and their own angle. And actually recognizing that the more time you can gain value from those very primal, ultimately free experiences, let's say, uh, you know, or, you know, barefooting, you can practice it in your house, on the floor, in your kitchen now. Yeah. Um, but um, recognizing that those kind of experiences ultimately probably are better for you than any other medicine or uh, known physical therapy practice. Those things are hygienic, primal uh, experiences, 
are seem to have a hygienic role, i.e. keeping people fit and vital, resilient enough so that they're not sick as much, they're not depressed as much, they're uh, more likely to solve problems than, uh, than see them as uh, you know, things to stop from moving forward. Yep. And I do believe there's a connection between the resiliency that you discover in your own body and the resiliency you might find in your own thinking, right? In other words, if in your own mind, you've come to the conclusion, I'm getting older and therefore this because of that and this leads up to that and therefore, then you come to the conclusion that there's nothing you can do and you don't do anything well, yeah. you see what happens. You know, so I suggest at the very least reevaluate your primary um, primal philosophy, renegotiate with yourself that maybe some of these things this crazy guy is saying is true and do some experimenting since it's free. The sunlight and the bare feet and the breathing the air, fresh air if possible, <laughs> is a good first step. That's sort of what I'll be quote unquote preaching going forward now and seeing if I can uh, play the same tune for another 60 years why not give it a shot yeah no definitely so well, i guess this is a good point uh, now to go so what's your definition or what do you think is the secret of longevity oh attitude attitude has got to be one of the you know i mean obviously having the fundamentals right you can't have a good attitude and be feeding yourself poison and um moving in a way that's breaking you but um, if you don't have a good attitude, i.e. one that recognizes there will always be setbacks, it's almost the way the universe plays the game of helping us go to the next level. We need challenges. Challenges are wonderful opportunities. And if you have that attitude, what is it about anything that isn't interesting and inter worthwhile to examine in living. I mean, everything, even setbacks, become new opportunities to try new inventions and new ways to solve the riddle of whatever happens. Because all of us have setbacks too. Yeah. Health problems, accidents, relationship changes, economic downturn, whatever. But none of those, even those kind of things, even death itself in a way, even the approach of death, these are all new opportunities for us to find new ways to do better than we imagined we could do by being there in the driver's seat and taking control over our life as best as we know how and steer it more and more in the direction that we know somehow intuitively or through a talk like this or whatever. We know that we should do X, Y, and Z. We just haven't, we just haven't put it into drive yet. Put it in drive. Yeah. Get that thing going and see what happens. More people than others who do that report better than people who don't. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. That's what scientific backup. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what for you would be the free um, lifestyle <clears throat> or health or fitness things you could do that would have the greatest impact on your health, wellness, and also longevity? Okay, this is easy. Believe it or not, the first one is one I think you will find to be about as simple of one that you could hope for. Learn how to spend more time, including when you're sleeping, breathing through your nose with your mouth shut. Give that a look. Give that a little look. <laughs> and to get you inspired on that topic, Go and read a book written in the 1890s called Shut Your Mouth, written <laughs> by a guy um, who went and painted every Native American tribe in North America. He became very observant of all of them and their culture and their ways. And this one interesting behavior was one that was basically part of all of them, training children and people to keep their mouth shut. And it's just now recently breathing, there's, you know, breathing is becoming popular as a yeah. topic and there's reasons for it. And there's new data coming out uh, you know, covering all kinds of interesting things. Learn how to breathe through your nose. That's number one. Number two, take your shoes off more often, <laughs> as often as possible and find that you feel better when you do. <laughs> And finally, number three, every day, 
combine the first two ideas, breathing through your nose and standing bare feet outside in fresh air with sunlight shining on your face. <laughs> if you do those three things every day, I guarantee you 100% you are going to feel better than you did when you didn't do those three things. There you go. That's Barefoot Ted's three things in a nutshell. Perfect. So what advice would you give to anyone who's approaching 40 or has just reached 40 and they kind of viewing it negatively or with some kind of anxiety? Um, you're, you're nearly approaching 57. I've hit 51. So we've kind of like passed that hurdle, but I'm sure you have a perspective on what you can say to these people. Absolutely. You are, if you are turning 40 now or soon, whatever, you are a lucky lucky person because there has never been more good information about how to keep you happy and healthy out in the world than there has been as there is today now you just you can't imagine how lucky you are uh to not be an experiment for seed oil companies <laughs> and you know toxic sugar flavorings and uh, medicine that's not even good for animals no you're way way better off uh, young 40 year old you are approaching you. And furthermore, uh, the world you're getting ready to go into is about ready is in the cusp of having revolutions in all of these areas. And you're going to be an important part of it, both as a customer and as an entrepreneur, uh, finding new ways to share these kind of insights that we'll gain through nutraceuticals, through uh, new medicines and foods from algae to to fungi to microbiome stuff and new biometric stuff and new i mean folks don't dismay over the breakdown of some of the broken equipment and some of them are called nation states and some of them are called money but instead focus on the exciting world of all the people like you and other people who can communicate their insights and experiments to the world like we are doing now and get to work finding what works for you. And there's a great quote by um, a mentor of Martin Luther King, who was a famous American um, uh, civil rights leader. His mentor was a guy named Howard Thurman, who was a unusual uh, character because he was the only Baptist mystic. It's kind of like a kind of an oxymoron almost. <laughs> but he said, don't ask what the world needs. Instead, ask what makes you come alive and do it. Because what the world needs are people who have come alive. I so strongly agree with that way of thinking. And I say to anyone, whoever you are, what is it that makes you come alive? What is it that you've gained from being who you are, good, bad, or indifferent, that makes you have an insight that by sharing it or finding a way to, to share it or, uh, or tell it, you will benefit others so much, including yourself by doing it. Please look at the world that way. We will solve so many more problems so much more quickly if we think like that, starting with ourselves. Yep. So this is a good lead into to what's your life motto then? Uh, my, my, what is my life mo motto? Yep. Well, it's too easy to say, take it easy. <laughs> but what I do want to say along those lines is a concept that comes from the, our yoga friends. It's a world, word called ahimsa. Ahimsa is nonviolence. And there's many ways to interpret that. And, and some people will go so far, for example, they won't eat any living thing, you know, like that, because they don't want to apply violence to something. But I think it's far more applicable and much more realistic to apply it to oneself. And what I mean by that is make sure that you're kind to yourself. Make sure that you coax yourself consensually into getting on track to being a healthier and happier you. Don't do it necessarily by gun barrel discipline, 
that works. But I want you to coax yourself into looking at it as you want to get better, but bring everyone along and don't do it in such a way that you have to treat yourself poorly. Find a way. There's something about that that seems very important to me. I see a lot of people get so married to some kind of result that they tear themselves to pieces. And there might be times when you need to shoot that hard or work that hard in order to just see what you're made out of. But that's not the primary tool that you're going to use to get to your best self. Yep. It'll get you over some hurdles. It'll give you some courage to try new things, but ultimately find a strategy in living that it makes living enjoyable yeah. so that you want to do it more and better. And that's, I, that's what I mean by, you know, so take it easy. Um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, take it easy. No, very good. So another lead into what are free life lessons you've learned in life that you think would be of value to other people? Well, number one is recognize that you, because you're so unique in the universe as an individual, such a complex set of improbable uh, situations occurred in order for you to be whoever you are, wherever you are now. First of all, realize that that's a treasure and have some gratitude for having been so lucky to be who you are, thinking as you are now, whoever you are, even if you don't like your instant yeah. situation realize that because of everything that's happened to you, you're in a position to be able to do something unique with what you've learned, like no one else can. Find what that is and do it. That come alive part, that's a, that's a lesson. Uh, number two, don't listen to what, nobody else is you. Nobody else can be you. No one else is gonna be able to play that role. So you might come up with an idea or a strategy that other people don't understand, can't appreciate yet, don't believe in, uh, the research doesn't back it up, it's not acceptable, whatever, but it works for you. Don't care. Learn how to not care if other people don't understand why you do what you do. That is one of the lessons you need to overcome. Do what resonates with you, with what authentically feeds you. That's your job. Not to pretend that you're somebody else or doing something else to make somebody else happy, that's not good enough. That makes somebody else happy, but leaves you not in, you know, yeah. not the one that needs to be happy first. So that's the second thing. And finally, have the courage to start and start again, because it's never going to be um, a situation where you won't come to a wall and you're going to have to, you won't be able to go over it or under it or whatever. Start a different direction, yeah. but start. Start anew, always start anew, and always realize at some point you're going to get some wind. You're going to get a, you're going to get a, some wind in your sails. Something's going to catch. But if you don't start, nothing will happen, and you know what that's like. You get yep. nowhere, Definitely. and you get nowhere faster and faster all the time. <laughs> so, those are my three. Awesome. So, last question. This is the big one. What's your definition of living your best life, or what I call a legendary life? I think a legendary life is going to have courage and, but more importantly, a legendary life is going to reach a level where it is serene because it's continuously and regularly that person is making choices in their life little by little, better and better, such that they begin to allow the anxiety of failure or uh, the wrong path or uh, the failure, you know, the, the overcoming all of that and getting to the attitude that allows you to, with courage and serenity, uh, face the obstacles that you're going to have to face. That it, it's a lesson I learned from a, a, a simple philosopher that really resonates with me, that attitude of being serene, yep. staying calm, even in the face of very serious hardships is the trick to allow you to find the solution to the problem while you're in it 
because when you are overcome by anxiety and fear, you will not make the best decisions. You cannot make the best decisions. So learning how to stay serene and calm, even when you're faced with very difficult problems, I would say is the attitude of any legend who will be able to pass something valuable to others. They must be able to enact themselves serenely and uh, benefit from that attitude is my th attitude. <laughs> no, wonderful. So Ted, it's been awesome speaking to you. You've uh, definitely been uh, very inspirational. I'm sure a lot of people get some value out of this. So for anyone who's interested in uh, learning a little bit more about you and perhaps reaching out, how can they find you online? Well, you know, I'm, I'm uh, the usual suspects, you know, I'm, I'm barefoot underscore Ted at Instagram and I'm on the Facebook too. I have a barefoottedcom as my kind of like um, portal to things that I might be interested in and, and um, groups or organizations or events that I might be supporting and products. And then ultimately, uh, I would love people to um, become aware of my sandal brand called Luna Sandals, lunasandals.com. Um, probably we should come up, if you do such a thing, we can come up with some way to give a small discount to listeners who are interested in trying our sandals. But regardless, um, I'm going to keep sort of the, the attitude you've heard in this um, uh, uh, interview is uh, one that, you know, uh, I have been practicing and trying to get better at for some 10 years now. And I have to say it's the results are uh, better than expected. Yeah. So I'm pretty pleased. I'm pleased with the results and I'm going to continue on this experiment. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much once again, Ted. It's been wonderful. Right on. Great.